Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. A couple quick announcements, and then we're off into uh, a lot of horror. Um, real quick, this coming Saturday, December 10th, I'll be taping a new stand-up special in Minneapolis at the Parkway Theater. Woohoo! Two shows. Hopefully, I will finally be feeling normal again by you're, then. You're going to be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Uh, the shows have been listed as sold out for months, but we just released 50 tickets each show based on not needing as many seats as we thought we would for cameras. And you can go to dancummins.tv to grab those. Woohoo! We'll see you guys there. Mm-hmm. So exciting. And then uh, now for an exclusive 5,000 members on Patreon merch announcements, uh, Logan set up uh, set this up with a throwback to a very early favorite, Visibly Shaken. Oh, yeah. Shotgun in hand, Keith walks over to the door, turns on his porch light, peers through the eye hole to examine the source of the knocking, when suddenly his porch light goes out. His front porch has rapidly become unnaturally dark. Trembling and terrified, Keith asks, who's there? And a few months, a few months, moments later, a strange kid-like voice coldly demands, "Let us in." Ay, ay, ay. So, new Annabelle exclusive in store now, featuring a truly terrifying black-eyed kid rendition. And that—that's a thanks for hitting five thousand patrons mm-hmm. on Patreon. So, good job, guys! Yeah, Way to do it. You—you you. You unleashed that next level. Uh, head on over to badmagicmerch.com. You can check out the new T. Uh, sweatshirt and poster and then also I'll throw over to uh, Lindsay now some new Layla's some new Layla well you're doing the announcement oh yeah yeah the, the, <laughs> they're they're handmade by creeper Sierra Spicer look how cute they are I put them in the sock cam she developed her own pattern for some cute crochet Layla's oh, oh my god and given the nature of how these are made we have a very limited amount uh, we will continue to restock in batches. Yes, I got to meet Sierra uh, in Louisville mm-hmm. at your show just by happenstance, and she gave me one. So uh, this is the very first one, and we're going to let you use this Layla for the thank show you, today. Thank you, thank you. She's so cute. I'm obsessed yeah, with this her. Is, this is awesome. They're so sweet. Like a chenille fabric. Yeah. And then, and then before we go off into the stories, you have a giving tree update. Yes, so uh, just an update on our December charity, which is always, of course, the Bad Magic Giving Tree. Uh, This year we saw what we've seen every year, uh, year over year, is more need than ever, which is, you know, difficult. Uh, On the 21st of November, when we began accepting applications, we were monitoring the website, and there were over 450 people milling about, getting ready to apply, and then the slots filled in less than 30 seconds, if you can... Even believe it. So while we're proud to help those families that we can, we also want to acknowledge that there is a lot of people out there in our communities that really need help. So if you have the ability to help, either in your own communities or we're still accepting donations, um, at this point, our fans have donated on top of the Patreon donation, which is still to be determined at the time of this recording, but approximately $15,000. Uh, the fans have donated 9000 which means Dan wow. and I are personally also donating dollar for dollar another 9000 but we'll match up to 15 So yeah. if you guys have the ability, just those 5 and $10 donations really add up so quickly. That is the majority of our donations is $25 mm-hmm. or less. Um, <clears throat> you can send those Amazon gift cards to Giving Tree 2022. That's Giving Tree 2022 at badmagicproductions.com. And uh, yeah, that that will help bridge the gap between uh, helping these families and, you know, where is the money coming from? So we uh, appreciate it. Uh, and on a lighter note. And thanks, everyone. Look at this sweet baby Baphomet. Oh, baby <laughs> baby Baphomet that I also was given to by baby some fans Baphomet. in Louisville. I love this guy. He is so freaking cute. I just want to say thanks to our fans, Taylor and Jacob, for this sweetie. And it was really great to meet you guys. Thank you so much. You don't hear a lot of demons described as cute. I know, but come on. <laughs> if, this, if this is what was coming for me. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. 
I'll get you. All right. You. Well, sorry about my voice again. <laughs> uh, we are doing everything we can possibly do to get better. Sleeping all the time, taking Tamiflu, going to the doctor numerous times. This is the cold and slash flu from hell. Yeah, we have even given up uh, seeing our kids the, yeah. the past week and a half because we don't want to get them sick and yeah so we're just we are in our own eternal yeah. hell no one is more annoyed than we are about the sound of our voices yes uh, okay so what uh horror do you have for oh. us today before you show your socks i was i was on to socks i got so i'm so out of it yeah okay my my two stories today are uh one I have a lost time hiking loop kind of situation which is very bizarre uh anytime we visit mm. the woods I think interesting things happen, so I'm excited to share that story. And my second story is my new all-time favorite fan story. I love this story so much. It's so bizarre. Is it a sleep disorder, or has there been something going on for many moons with this person? It's a fascinating story. I love it. All right. Looking forward to hearing that. Um, first up, I have a story about of an entity supposedly seen by at least one inmate and at least one guard or corrections officer on multiple occasions in a Texas prison. So how would you like to be trapped in a cell with the ghost of a murderer? That's so weird. I was just reading a fan story about a haunted prison in Texas. Oh, interesting. I, I was like, wait a second, what's happening in my brain? Then my second final story is a story of the infamously haunted doll and star of the Conjuring universe, Annabelle. <gasps> Have we never told that story? No, I was I was sure we had. Looked back through the notes multiple times, unless my cold brain has just uh, destroyed my ability to even read. Which um, has maybe. been a thing. Uh, no, we have not told that story. What? I was positive we had too, but nope. Harold, Robert, but we've never done Annabelle? I don't, not, nope, not, not according to my notes. So I apologize if we have, but I looked over and over because I was sure that we had. And I was like, wait a minute. No. Okay, well, even if we have, it's a great story. I don't think we have. I, I, I talked about it on Time Suck a long time ago. Yeah. But I don't think we've ever told the story here. Okay, well, on the off chance that we have, you're a great storyteller okay. and it's a great story. So it will be enjoyed by all. Do you think we have? I just, it just, I think like you, I'm like, we must have. No, nah, I look, I looked. Uh, Maybe it was a beta episode. I couldn't even find it in that. I don't know. Weird. Okay. So, so get those cozy socks locked and loaded. Yep. I'm ready for the holiday season. I got some Christmas trees. I've even got Christmas tree earrings on today. I wore green. It's to detract from the <laughs> fact that I have not washed my hair in three days. And this was the first time I washed my face in three days. I have on no <laughs> makeup. I'm lucky I remember to brush my teeth. Okay. Okay. All right, here we go. You ready? Ready. Time now for the tale of the ghost of a killer. I worked for the state of Texas as a corrections officer for 30 years. And for the first 29, while I had experienced what I considered mild paranormal encounters in my personal life, odd cold spots, the feeling of being watched, maybe seeing a shadowy apparition quickly scurry across a room out of the corner of my eye, I'd never experienced anything intense, never anything at work. Back in 2013, I was almost retired. I only had about a year to go. My job in the last prison I worked at usually took me to what was called four building, which had three wings to it. The building was for the hard cases we had to deal with. Inmates who got in trouble for more than just not following the rules and regulations set forth by the state of Texas. This was for guys who were violent or escape risks, most of them members of various prison gangs. I worked a graveyard shift. I hated it, but oh well, I was counting down the days, less than a year away from a full retirement pension. Each night, I worked a 12-hour shift, and each night, we were required to start count soon after we came on shift, which would be around 6.30. Various counts went on through the night and into the morning hours, with one being a bed book count. A bed book count was a visual count. The inmate comes to the cell door and shows his inmate ID card, and the CO has his clipboard with the inmate roster showing the correct ID number. Both numbers obviously have to match. It's the most important count of the entire 12-hour shift, the bed book count usually came after breakfast was served. Breakfast in a prison in Texas, as far as I know, is still served around three in the morning. Holy crap. At least it was when I worked there, early as hell. We'd serve breakfast that early so that prisoners could be fed before they'd be transported out for various morning court appearances, which were constant. The day this all happened, I took my clipboard and attached the roster to it. I started in C wing and ended up in A wing. There were 21 cells on the top row and 22 cells on the bottom row with two tiers in each of the three wings. My walk started at the top and went to the bottom row. As I walked along the bottom row of A wing, I had just reached cell 19 and was busy checking my inmate roster. When I looked up, 
There stood a 30-something healthy-looking Hispanic man looking at me through the cell door window. He was so close to the cell door window that if he was any closer, I would have felt his breath. Being very surprised to see him there, startled really, I smiled and said something to the effect of, what, I didn't see you there. Instead of answering me, he just stared. I didn't like his eyes. Sadly, I'd seen eyes like his too many times before. Dead, cold eyes. The eyes of someone who has done things that can't be forgiven. Things that change you in a way there's no coming back from. The eyes of a cold-blooded killer. He also flashed a strange grin I didn't care for at all. I was about to ask him what was so funny. But then he turned around and he vanished right before my eyes. Immediately, I was covered in goosebumps. After his spirits vanished, I could see an older Hispanic man rise up from the bottom bunk and he asked, Who are you talking to, boss? I said, there was a 30 or so year old Hispanic inmate at the cell door window and he vanished. And this older inmate went white. He sighed, shook his head and said, I knew he was real. (gasps) He pointed towards the top bunk and said, boss, that bunk has been empty for months. I'm the only one here. He begged me to move him to a different cell. I asked him if he had any idea who the ghost was. And he said that asking around, he heard that Juan Rodriguez Chavez used to be in prison in his cell. Chavez was a serial killer, the thrill killer, they called him who killed around a dozen people, shot him down in cold blood, killed his first known victims when he was just 17. And he was known to smirk at the families of his victims at both of his murder trials. A smirk like the strange grin I didn't care for. He was executed via lethal injection in April of 2003 at the age of 34. Damn. This older man, his name was Felipe. I think he said that he'd seen this ghost like three separate times. He said he once woke up for breakfast and thought he'd somehow been assigned a new cellmate and somehow just not woken up to hear him enter the cell. He said he was scrambling to think how that could even be possible when the spirit spoke to him. You okay, old man? You don't look so good. Said he stared at him with the coldest eyes he'd ever seen and flashed a grin that really bothered him. And then just like with my encounter, he vanished. Second time, he said, was scarier. Maybe six months after the first encounter, he said he woke up in the middle of the night around one to the feeling of someone sitting down on his bunk with him. When he opened his eyes, he saw before him that same spirit, sitting on the edge of his bed, staring down at him. Instead of speaking this time, he just stared, stared at Felipe like he wanted to kill him. Felipe thought he was going to kill him, and then again, he just vanished. The final time he saw him was a few years later, just a couple months prior to my sighting. He said this time was by far the worst of all. He told me he woke up again in the middle of the night to the feeling of being smothered now. Woke up to having a pillow being pressed down into his face. Oh my God. He couldn't move it off because his legs and arms were pinned. It felt like someone was sitting on his shoulders, pushing the pillow down hard into him, cutting off his air supply. He couldn't even scream. The pillow muffled any sound he tried to make. He started to lose consciousness and then suddenly the weight on top of him lifted. His arms now free, threw the pillow aside and sucked in a big breath of air. Then he bolted up to a sitting position and saw the same spirit now standing on the other side of his cell door. Same dead eyes, same sinister smile. And then poof, just disappeared. Felipe again begged me to move him to a different cell. I told him there was nothing I could do. I didn't assign the cells, and none of my superiors were going to take a haunting seriously. He looked so defeated when I resumed my count. I honestly felt bad for him. I wished him luck. Didn't know what else I could do. I hated doing his count after that. He kept asking me to get him help, get him transferred, and I kept telling him there was nothing I could do. A few months later, when I did counts, Felipe looked pale as a ghost. He wasn't doing well. He said it happened again, that the thing showed up again and tried to smother him. Told me he saw him standing there staring at him after tearing the pillow off of his face. That was the last time he saw that thing that I was aware of before I retired. I had a few friends who kept working there after I was done, and one of them took over my rounds on that same shift. He got to know Felipe a bit too. Felipe never said anything to him about seeing that ghost again, but about six months after I was done, Felipe died in his cell. My friend found him. Found him laying in his bed with his hands down at his side and a look of absolute terror across his face. His cause of death was ruled a heart attack. I don't think so. I think at least as far as what he probably saw in his mind, he was smothered. I'm convinced that Juan Rodriguez Chavez claimed another victim from beyond the grave and I'm overjoyed I'll never have to walk past that cell he was housed in ever again. That's terrifying. I mean, okay, I get it. I know Felipe is a hardened criminal. Mm Mm-hmm. But, like, that actually makes it more terrifying to me. Because people might say, like, oh, well, I mean, he deserves it. What did that guy do mm, to end up in mm. that prison cell? Okay. Put all of your morality aside. Yeah. You are talking about a hardened fucking criminal mm-hmm. in prison who is 
petrified of a ghost. Yeah. Like of all of the things that oh, they, yeah, yeah. Like when you think about that, like they've like seen gangs and murders and I, whatever yeah, who they've knows seen. What Felipe did, yeah. Right, and he's probably seen just being in prison mm-hmm. for all those years as an old man. I'm guessing he's been there for a long time. Yeah, it's like he has seen the depravity of humanity. Yeah, for him to be petrified of something that can't be seen by others like Mm -hmm. that makes it a thousand times creepier to me Mm -hmm. and also i'm really sorry if you guys can hear my stomach my stomach the medication that we're on i know mine too it's i wonder if mine was being picked up by the mic i'm like dear god that no it's mine (laughs) wow (laughs) we're special a uh, couple couple pictures here this uh first one no high res images i can find for the killer juan rodriguez chavez that this was the was, best I could find. Was this a killer that you were familiar with at mm-hmm. all? No. The thriller killer. It's or, yeah, crazy. I think the thrill kill. Yeah. Or thrill yeah. kill. Yeah. Thrill thrill killer. Regardless, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. Uh, amazing how many like prolific killers there are <sighs> out there that we don't disturbing. even know about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, not 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 like a young with him. handsome guy too. Hmm. Uh, this next one just a picture of a guy in a prison cell. A little visual. To help imagine something being with you in a tiny room that you can't escape trying to hurt you. There's have, nowhere to go. Have you ever been in a prison cell? No, I've been in a holding cell. Oh, yeah. Like in jail, but like not prison. When I uh, worked in production, we got to film at an old prison. Yeah. And it's just an inherently... Well, I guess Alcatraz, when you and I went. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we got to peek in those little cells, yeah. Yeah, and we like got to walk into some of them. Jails, prisons, they're just inherently creepy because they're yeah. so sterile and mm-hmm. you just have to think about like what happens there mm-hmm. or what you did to get there. Mm-hmm. By the way, this Baphomet Who's is so you? great. Oh man, it's probably making us sick. No, <laughs> this is a sweet little Baphomet. Um, so uh, you ready, ready to move on? Yeah, I don't have any questions. We kind of like, I'm, what is there to ask? Yeah, yeah I, I like there's a little shorter story and just um, got right to it. Yeah. That's that's an awful way to die. Oh, yeah. Alone, prison. So sad. Oh, so sad. Again, I know Felipe is probably not a good guy. Well, obviously not. I mean, he's in prison, but it's well, so sad. I mean, there's good people in prison. You, there are people who do bad things that go to prison and become better people. Huh? Yeah. yeah there's good, is that yeah. what we're saying? Mm, there's good people who've done I, I guess. Listen, what do we know? Felipe, somebody might have done something to his kids, and he might have gone so, out and murdered them. And mm-hmm. then, you know what? High five, Felipe. Totally. I'm going to get all crystalled up. I'm fucking terrified to tell this story. I'm so scared because I know how scary it is. Mm. Putting all the crystals in all the pockets. You just keep talking. Okay. Time to cover an infamous entity. Annabelle the doll. Oh, God. Can't believe we're just finally covering her now. Uh, um, I was sure, again, like we said earlier, we already told this story, but I don't think so. Strongly guessing that almost everyone listening to this podcast has heard of Annabelle. I'm sure at least almost everyone has. Annabelle's reportedly very haunted Raggedy Ann doll said to be possessed by an inhuman oh demonic entity. Currently housed in Ed and Lorraine Warren's occult museum. Oh my God. Closed to the general public at the moment in Monroe, Connecticut. Annabelle has moved to this or was moved to the sacred site after the doll allegedly displayed intense paranormal activity in the 1970s. Annabelle was introduced to most horror fans in the opening sequence of the first Conjuring movie in 2013. Great open to a horror movie, by the way. And then Annabelle got her own movie in 2014, simply called Annabelle, followed by a prequel in 2017 called Annabelle Creation, and a sequel in 2019, Annabelle Comes Home. I've watched zero Annabelle movies. That's how fucking scared of this doll I am. (laughs) Oh, God. All three Annabelle movies were massive box office successes since uh, uh, now by tens of millions, or seen, there we go, my God, seen by uh, tens of millions of people, if not hundreds of millions around the world. Uh, I wrote since instead of seen. I'm like, what am I trying to say? (laughs) However, the true origin story of Annabelle is a much lesser known paranormal tale. In 1970, a student nurse from Hartford, Connecticut was gifted the Raggedy Ann doll by her mother. Um, Soon she reported that the doll was acting strangely, that the doll was scaring her and she reached out to various people in the paranormal community for help. A psychic eventually told her that the doll was inhabited by the spirit of a dead girl named Annabelle. The student and a roommate continued to try and take care of the doll, hoping that while the doll was certainly spooky, it was also harmless. But then when it attacked their roommate, they knew something was seriously wrong, that the doll might be inhabited by something far more nefarious than the spirit of a little girl. They reached out to a priest for help, which led them to now famous demonologist Ed and Lorraine Warren. Time now for the true tale of Annabelle. The real Annabelle was a gift from a mother to her 28-year-old daughter, Donna. 
Donna's mom purchased a doll from a hobby store in 1970. Did your mom do this to your sister? No. And surprising to me, it wasn't used. Or probably wasn't. The doll was most likely brand new because this particular version of the Raggedy Ann doll wasn't prior to, didn't exist prior to 1970. It certainly, if you didn't know the story around it, doesn't look scary. Just a cute, now classic Raggedy Ann doll. Fairly large one, about three feet tall. Donna was a nursing student at the time who lived with another student named Angie. And Angie was engaged to a man named Lou, who also lived with Angie and Donna in the apartment. Donna put the doll in her bed, the equivalent of a decorative pillow, really. And while she didn't get any bad feelings from the doll originally, strange things started happening soon after Donna brought the doll into her apartment. And the activity would continue for a month before Donna sought help. Donna said that she kept coming home and finding her doll in different positions. At first, the moves were subtle. The doll stayed on her bed, but would be in a slightly different position than how she was when she'd left it that morning. Because the doll was still on her bed, though, she initially assumed that maybe it just had fallen over or that she forgot how she'd left it. But then within within the first few weeks, the doll started moving into different rooms. Now, while she wanted to believe that Angie or Lou were playing some kind of joke on her and moving the doll to scare her, that just wasn't like them. And she believed them when they said they had nothing to do with it. And she started to fear Annabelle. But not enough to get rid of it. Not yet. She started to place it outside her room. She didn't want to sleep near it. But Annabelle wouldn't stay where she was supposed to. If Donna left the doll in the living room, it would end up back in her bedroom, even if she kept the door shut. And Annabelle kept ended up uh, kept ending up being found in unnatural positions for a doll, as if, she were, as, if, ah, as if she were a living entity. She'd find the doll sitting up with its arms folded and legs crossed, or actually standing on its feet. The doll was once found kneeling on a chair. This position was particularly frightening because the doll couldn't actually kneel on its own without falling over when they tried to replicate this. Now Donna was a little creeped out, but also curious. Was it actually haunted? And if so, by who? Around this time, Donna started to find messages written on parchment paper in the apartment. Some of them read, help me. Donna didn't have any parchment paper and had no idea where it came from. The handwriting on the notes looked like it was written by a small child. They wondered, could the doll actually be writing these notes? They initially told themselves that was impossible, and Donna and Angie worried that someone was breaking in, that maybe whoever was writing these notes was also whoever had snuck into their place and moved the doll around. When they left for work one morning while Lou was out of the apartment, they put tape across the door and placed a rug behind it just so, so that when they came back home, they'd be able to tell if anyone had disturbed it. The tape was never disturbed, the rug never moved, but the notes continued to be found. The doll continued to move. As crazy as it sounds, they felt Annabelle had to be behind it all. And now the paranormal activity inside their apartment escalated. Once a piece of chocolate materialized out of thin air on top of their stereo around Christmas time. In another incident, the women women and Lou from the other side of the room witnessed a statue levitate up into the air and then crash down onto the floor. On another occasion, Donna came home from work and had to fight back a scream when she found the doll on her bed. Because she saw what looked like blood in the doll's hand. Oh my God. And three drops of blood on his chest. There was absolutely no rational explanation for how the blood could have gotten there. No one living in the apartment had recently hurt themselves. Still though, no one was ready to get rid of Annabelle. It was still in its own way, strangely, fun. It was exciting to bear witness to such odd happenings. A few days later, Donna decided to put her doll in a kitchen chair in the morning. She joked that the doll was going to eat breakfast with them. She did this two more times, and on the third day... The doll's arms raised up onto the table in front of everyone. Interestingly, Donna and Angie, still not scared. But they decided that they should talk to a medium, because now they were certain that a spirit was trapped inside the doll. One of their fellow nurses knew a medium and put the girls in contact with them. The medium came to their apartment, conducted a seance with Donna and Angie, and told them that the doll was inhabited by the spirit of a little girl named Annabelle, who was about six when she died said she had once played in a field on uh, uh, some land the apartment complex was built on, that she'd also lived in a building on the same property, and outside of her tragically young demise, she said her time spent in the building was a happy time. But then she was hit by a car and killed on the street directly in front of the apartment. The spirit of Annabelle also said that she felt comforted by Donna and Angie, and that she wanted to stay with them, be loved by them. Donna and Angie's hearts bled for this poor little girl. They felt terrible. And they decided, since Annabelle was supposedly the spirit of a harmless little girl, that she could stay with them. That they would love her. It was only after this seance that they started calling the doll Annabelle. 
Things escalated with Annabelle almost immediately after this seance, and soon she wouldn't seem so harmless. Lou had disliked the doll from the beginning. Annabelle creeped him out. He told Donna it was evil, that they should get rid of it, but Donna didn't want to. She still believed Annabelle was possessed by nothing more again than this lonely and harmless little girl who just wanted a home and people to love her. But then Lou would claim that this harmless little girl almost killed him. One day he woke up from sleeping on the couch and couldn't move. He saw Annabelle standing at his feet. Lou would later say in an interview with Ed and Lorraine Warren, This thing gives me bad dreams, recurrent ones. But yet what I'm going to tell you is not a dream as far as I'm concerned because I somehow saw this happen to me. I fell asleep at home, a really deep sleep. While I was lying there, I saw myself wake up. Something seemed wrong to me. I looked around the room, but nothing was out of place. But then when I looked down towards my feet, I saw the rag doll, Annabelle. It was slowly gliding up my body. It moved over my chest and stopped. Then it put its two arms out. One arm touched one side of my neck. The other touched the other like it was making an electrical connection. And then I saw myself being strangled. I was writhing and trying to push it all off my chest, but I might as well have been pushing on a wall because it wouldn't move. I was, it was literally strangling me to death, but I couldn't help myself no matter how hard I tried. Before passing out, Lou snapped out of whatever trance-like state had left him paralyzed and was able to toss the doll aside where it now lay motionless. Despite this encounter, Donna still wouldn't part with the doll. Tried to blame Lou's encounter as a nightmare he just thought was real. She wasn't ready to accept that Annabelle wasn't harmless at all. Soon after this experience, Lou and Angie were studying some maps before Lou headed out on a trip when they heard rustling from Donna's room. Lou went to the door and waited outside until the noises stopped. When he entered the room, he saw the doll lying on the floor in a corner. He knew Donna hadn't left it like that, and he got the chills. As he slowly and cautiously walked over to it, he suddenly felt a presence behind him. He spun around but saw nothing. But then the very next moment, he grabbed his chest in pain. He was bleeding, and his skin was burning. He lifted his chest and found seven claw marks, three vertical and four horizontal. But still, Donna was not ready to part with the doll. Annabelle had yet to harm her. However, after Lou was attacked, after talking with an angry and frightened Lou and Angie, Donna did reach out to a local Episcopalian priest, Father Hegan. He then contacted his superior, Father Cook, and soon Father Cook contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren. The Warrens would convince Father Cook to perform an exorcism on Donna's apartment. Ed and Lorraine soon started to, uh, sat down to talk to Donna, Angie, and Lou. When Donna started talking about Annabelle, Ed interrupted her to ask who that was. Angie said that Annabelle belonged to Donna. And Lorraine asked, is Annabelle a live, breathing thing? Donna was confused. Is she alive? She moves. She acts alive. But no, I don't think she's alive. She continued, after I got the doll for my birthday, I put it on my bed each morning after the bed was made. The arms would be off to its sides, and its legs would be straight out. But when we'd come home at night, the arms and legs would be positioned in different gestures. For instance, its legs would be crossed at the ankles, or its arms would be folded in its lap. After a week or so, this made me suspicious. So to test it, I purposely crossed its arms and legs in the morning to see if it really was moving. And sure enough, every night when we'd come back home, the arms and legs would be uncrossed, and the thing would be sitting there in any of a dozen different postures. Ed suggested that someone might have been breaking in and playing a joke on them, but they told him that no one had broken in. They also discussed their meeting with the psychic medium. After further questioning, the Warrens determined that the doll was not possessed by the spirit of any little girl. They felt the doll was possessed by an inhuman presence, that is, something demonic, because spirits do not possess inanimate objects. And more troubling, they were concerned that the entity was using the doll's body only temporarily, that it was really seeking to possess a human. Tony Spira, the Warren's son-in-law, later wrote in his blog, Truly the spirit was not looking to stay attached to the doll. It was looking to possess a human host. The spirit, or in this case an inhuman demonic spirit, was essentially in the infestation stage of the phenomenon. It first began moving the doll around the apartment by means of teleportation to cause the occupants curiosity in hopes that they would give it recognition. Then, predictably, the mistake of bringing a medium into the apartment to communicate with it. The inhuman spirit, now able to communicate through the medium, preyed on the girl's emotional vulnerabilities by pretending to be a rather harmless, lost young girl, with which during the seance was allowed permission from Donna to haunt the apartment. Insofar as demonic is a negative spirit, it then set about causing patently negative phenomena to occur. It aroused fear through the use of drops of blood in the doll and ultimately even attacked Lou. If Donna and Angie hadn't reached out for help, the Warrens were certain that the entity would have moved on to full possession in just a few more weeks. Father Cook, the Episcopal priest, now performed an exorcism throughout the apartment. There was no disturbances during the exorcism. 
Following it, Donna asked Ed and Lorraine to take Annabelle with them when they left, and they did. They put her in the backseat of their car and drove home, and Ed refused to take the interstate in case the spirit was still inside the doll. He wasn't sure the thing wouldn't try and cause him to wreck and didn't want to risk traveling at that speed. And then sure enough, on their way home from the exorcism, the Warrens claimed that their power steering and brakes failed on numerous occasions. So they almost crashed multiple times until Ed doused the doll with holy water, and then they had no more mechanical problems. Ed and Lorraine then had, then had a special case built for Annabelle because she escaped several times in the first few weeks of being at their house. At first, Ed placed Annabelle in a chair next to his desk where he claimed to see the doll levitate. Then the doll, they claimed, began to move from room to room. Once when they left home, they locked the doll in their office on another building on the property. And when they got back, they found Annabelle sitting in Ed's easy chair in the main house. According to their most infamous book, The Demonologist, a black cat materialized next to Annabelle on several occasions. It would appear, walk around Ed's office, then return to Annabelle and disappear. They now had a special blessed case built to house the doll and try and trap it. Annabelle's original case has a sign on it that reads, Warning, positively do not open. The case has a wooden frame infused with holy oil and holy water, and there are three crosses attached to it. Two figures of St. Michael, a copy of the Lord's Prayer, and a prayer to St. Michael. But all, of that might still not been, but all of that might still not have been enough to prevent this thing from attacking those who really upset it. In a video tour of the Occult Museum, Ed claims that Annabelle is responsible for the death of at least one museum visitor saying many of the objects in this room here have had dire effects on people. People have been maimed, have been killed. People have wound up in mental institutions because of the many things that are right here in this building. You have voodoo dolls, you have this Raggedy Ann doll, which was responsible for the death of a young man who came in here one time, who challenged the doll to do its worst, and it did. According to the story, the man and his girlfriend came to the occult museum on a motorcycle. During the tour, the man mocked Annabelle, tapping on the glass case, challenging Annabelle to scratch him. Ed kicked him out of the museum. Three hours later, he supposedly crashed his motorcycle into a tree, killing himself instantly. His girlfriend was hurt bad enough to be hospitalized for more than a year. The girlfriend told Ed they were laughing about Annabelle when her boyfriend lost control of the motorcycle. Annabelle has also hated any clergymen who visit. Father John Bradford, an exorcist, once visited the Warrens, supposedly picked up Annabelle and said, You're just a ragdoll. You can't hurt anyone. Ed warned him he shouldn't say that, but the priest insisted God is more powerful than any devil and demon. A few hours after Father Jason left, he called to tell Lorraine that his brakes failed. Brakes failed at a busy intersection. He was injured, shook up, and scared, but he'd live. The last thing he allegedly remembered before the accident was looking into his rearview mirror and seeing Annabelle looking back at him. Annabelle also seems to have disturbed at least one law enforcement officer. Ed was working with a police detective on a local case. Ed said that this man had seen everything, did not scare easily. As they were in the office talking, Lorraine called him upstairs to answer a phone call. Ed told him to look around, but don't touch anything. Ed said he was gone for only a few minutes. When he returned, the detective approached him, white and shaking. He mumbled, the doll, the rag doll, it's real. And then refused to tell Ed, refused to tell Ed what happened next. He also supposedly quit the force shortly after that encounter. Five years before she died at the age of 92 in 2014, Lorraine Warren spoke of Annabelle in an interview. She explained why she and Ed never got rid of the doll. She said it would be quite careless on my part to get rid of it. As explained in The Conjuring, getting rid of the doll would only get rid of the vessel, not the evil that resides within the doll. At least as it sits, we know where it resides. It isn't out in the world causing harm to others. We have a Catholic priest who performs a binding prayer around the doll, which acts as a blockade. The evil can't penetrate the holy prayers that bind it. Think of it as something to a, similar to a, an electric fence, keeping the dog within set boundaries. They've never allowed anyone to touch the doll, not since that exorcist, because according to Lorraine, a person's aura may mingle with the aura of that evil force within the doll and cause great harm to the person. And now their son-in-law, Tony Spira, currently the curator of the New England Paranormal Research Center and manager of the items in the occult museum, also makes sure that no one touches Annabelle. He said he's been offered up to $2 million for Annabelle, but has refused to sell it. Good for him. The Warrens Occult Museum was closed in 2017 due to a zoning violation. Neighbors often complained about people knocking on the doors at all hours to ask about the museum. On February 22, 2017, Dan Rivera, senior lead investigator of the New England Society of Paranormal Research, moved Annabelle to a new case. Tony had Annabelle moved into a portable, similarly blessed case to take her to a Night of Annabelle event. On August 14, 2020, there were rumors online that Annabelle somehow escaped her enclosure. Tony Spirit quickly debunked the rumors in a YouTube video, saying, I'm here to tell you something. 
I don't know if you want to hear this or not, but Annabelle did not escape. Annabelle's alive. Well, I shouldn't say alive. Annabelle's here in all her infamous glory. She never left the museum. Remember, I have high-tech security here. If she had left the museum, I'd, I'd have instantly known that something happened or somebody broke in. I have a good alarm system here, and the police are good to respond. They respond within a couple minutes, maybe if that. She didn't go anywhere. I appreciate all the concern. I'd be concerned if Annabelle really did leave because she is nothing to play with. I didn't know about that supposed like Annabelle getting out. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I just was having like immediate um, practical joke, but also not funny. Like you just leave it that like she escaped. And then I just like have Annabelle dolls in your hotel room. Oh my God. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my God. That doll is so scary. Or whatever yeah. possesses it. Mm-hmm. Uh. I have some. I have some pictures, and this first one, old photo of the early seventies, uh, from the early seventies of Ed and Lorraine standing next to Annabelle in a protective case. Uh. And then this next one, another picture of Annabelle in her case at the Occult Museum, taken in more recent years. I mean, it really does look so harmless. I know mm-hmm. she's not. I know that whatever possesses it. Oof. And then the Conjuring Universe's depiction of Annabelle. Yeah, which is more... More terrifying. Yeah. And I was going to say like porcelain doll. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. And then this is an Annabelle replica. Uh, if you want to buy, no, you thanks. can find it on Etsy. Nope. Unnecessary. But good job. Yeah. Whoever made that. Mm-hmm. Why you would do that is beyond me, but... And sorry oh. if I seem if I seem spaced or anything. I'm just I don't have a lot to get today. I know. I know. Yeah. But we're doing it. And yep. that was a great story. And now that... Uh, now that you told the story, I can say I, with pretty certain confidence, I don't think we actually ever did tell mm-hmm. that story here, which is crazy. Like, I don't know how we could not tell that story. I, I think I remember why. I think early on, it hadn't been that long since I had told, done an episode on the demon, on, on the Ed and Lorraine Warren on Time Suck. Yeah. Where I had gone over a lot of those details. Yeah. And just didn't want to do it again really quick. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Well, Creepy. Mm-hmm. So creepy. Um, I also, I think I've decided that Donna is the female Darren. Because ah. why the fuck wouldn't you get rid of that doll? I mean, she was like <coughs> so obsessed, but it was causing so many problems, but she wouldn't let it go. And that's very much like Darren in his Ouija board. Like he wouldn't get rid of it despite all the problems it was causing. So I think. Yeah, Donna. Uh, Donna. Donna and Darren. Okay. Okay. And I do feel bad that, you know, we have a family member named Donna. Yeah, my sister. Yeah. But, uh, ugh. It just is what it is. It goes, they go well together, Darren and Donna. Darren and Donna. Mm-hmm. I know. At first, I thought it was going to be Angie and Donna because collectively the two girls didn't want to get rid of it. But the longer it goes on, the more Donna is adamantly not getting rid of it. Also, at 28 years old, my mom was not buying me a doll. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought that that was like an interesting, <laughs> like, that's an interesting gift for a 28 year old. Here, yeah. sweetie, here's a raggedy Ann doll. I, 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 I didn't get the feeling though that she. Gave it to her to play with. More, no, I didn't either. But it was a kid's doll. It wasn't like a collectible. No. I don't think. I mean, says the woman know, who's holding decorative. a stuffed boff in Yeah, 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 true, yeah. <laughs> At 39. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I mean, that's an interesting choice of gifts from true, a mom. But true, But maybe she infantilized. In, infantilized. I can't say anything right now. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, her I, know, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I did, what did I write down? Annabelle. Oh, oh. So obviously, to me, it's like that the Annabelle, yeah. forget about the doll, but Annabelle, the deceased child or demon, I think that at some point it would have possessed something at that apartment, that land, because it wasn't about the doll. It just that it happened to take form in the doll because Annabelle, the child, died on that like property or near that property in an accident. So it's like, it, it, mm. I don't feel like the mom like bought the doll and and the doll was possessed and she gave it to the daughter i think that the spirit was somewhere like milling about yeah and it wasn't that little girl anyway you know that was well right but ultimately i think that it would have happened to somebody at that apartment through some inanimate object at some point i don't know like i said i'm brain dead i got nothing for you i know i'm just (laughs) okay i'm just trying to throw out a theory there that i don't think that uh that the doll came with the spirit. I think the spirit was in in that building. Well, yeah, because they said that uh, there. Well, there was a little girl that according, died according to the medium. Yeah, so that like if, yeah. if there was in fact a little girl that died in that area, and then a demon used that little girl's mm. spirit 
to possess the doll. I think it's just happenstance that like the doll is what. I, I, I don't think the little girl, I think that was all nonsense. You don't think the little girl no, ever I, existed? I, I, nope. I think that was a, a false reading. Hmm. According to Ed and Lorraine Warren. Yeah. That was yeah. their take on it. That there never was a little girl who died there. That was all just nonsense. Just a story manufactured by this demonic entity. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm going to put my Baphomet down. He's so cute. <laughs> oh, you can't see him anymore. He's hiding. Um, <clears throat> do you have your special edition, Layla? I do. It's so cute. I love it so much. Thanks again, Sierra, for making those. Okay. Let's do my side. You can just listen. You can just relax. Done. Done. Done, 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 done. So it's been a little while, I think, since we've had a... Um, <clears throat> fan hiking camping hiking story but we've had a number of them over the years mm -hmm. uh you know it's always like it's weirdly quiet people get turned around people get lost like just strange happenings and and this story is also no different in that in that way uh i was reflecting as i was putting the story together we haven't gone camping since we started this show and, I know, I, and not because of this we just uh, yeah <clears throat> we just haven't had time we haven't had time but also yeah. I don't really know that I'm interested in camping in anything other than like, I don't know, an RV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I think my days of tent camping because of this show alone might be over. Might be over. Might be over, my friend. Also, like, you know, I got a bed back, so I'll just use that as my excuse. <laughs> All right, well, let's find out what's going on in the woods. Dear Queen of the Peeps and King of the Suck, I stumbled across your show about two months ago and I'm now all caught up. You could say I'm a bit of a creep, but for background, I'm a supervisor with my city's EMS department. So while I believe, I tend to still be analytical and a bit of a skeptic. I tried to explain away this story in more ways than one, but to this day, it still sends a shiver up my spine, even when thinking about it. Now, time for the tale of Lost in the Woods. I'd consider myself an avid hiker, getting out at least a few times a month, if not more. There's a reservation area near me with a hundred or so miles of trails that make it easy for me to get moving often. It was an early morning when I got there and the trail I was doing is a favorite of mine, having hiked it at least a dozen or so times to the point where I could do it blindfolded. I've been on this trail all times of day with or without other people in the rain. You name it. I've been there. I've come across plenty of strange rocks and stick formations. Usually, they're from parents playing with kids or drunk teenagers. But there has always been rumors of people performing witchcraft out in these woods. Everything was normal for the majority of my hike. About uh, After about a mile in, the sound of the nearby highway faded away and let in the sounds of birds chirping and the winds rustling through the trees. I made it to my halfway point in just under two hours and did my usual ritual of making some coffee and staring out over the sea of trees for a while. I packed everything up and started to make my way back, which should have put me back at my truck at about 10 a.m. With about a mile or so left, I decided to walk down a side path that goes along the opposite side of a dense group of trees that I would normally go on. When I say side path, we're talking about one-tenth of a mile that loops right back onto the main trail. Within a couple of minutes, uh, within a couple of minutes, right on the bend of the trail was a handmade rock fire pit, big enough to fit maybe a small pan on it with a fresh pile with a fresh wood pile in it. In contrast, though, everything else was soaked. It had rained the night before, and I had spent the trek walking through mud and around large puddles. I thought, huh, that's weird. And I took a picture of it, but then kept walking. After about five minutes of walking, I'm back on the bend, looking at this fire pit again. Thinking I somehow got turned around, I walked back down the path, and a few minutes later, hmm. there I am again. This is the point when I noticed the eerie quiet. I should still be hearing birds and be starting to hear traffic on the highway. Instead, all I could hear was an oscillating hum and a slight ringing in my ears. I walked back down the trail and two more times ended up right back in front of this pit. I couldn't shake the feeling of eyes watching me the whole time. I checked my GPS for probably the fifth time, and there was no way I could have walked in a circle without purposely doing so. I sat there for a few minutes, trying to get my bearings, and tried to make my way down the path, this time finally getting back on the main trail. The sounds of the highway came alive, 
And about 15 minutes later, I was back at my truck, changing my boots and furiously smoking a couple cigarettes. (laughs) When I looked down at my phone, it was almost one o'clock in the afternoon. To add to the weirdness, the tracker I use shows me sitting in one place for quite a while instead of walking in circles. And the picture Mm. I took, nowhere to be found. I still don't know what happened that day, and it took me a long time to go back out on that trail. The times I've been out there since, both by myself and with others, nothing weird has ever happened. And even when I've gone looking for that fire pit, I could never find it or even a place I recognized as the spot I had come across before. Stay safe in the woods because something is watching. Keep the scares coming. Three out of five stars. Mm -hmm. S. S. That's a great story. Just different from anyone I can remember hearing. Yeah, it's just so like, like... I, I could so easily picture it, like being on this trail and being like, oh, I'm just going to go right here and it's going to loop me right back. Mm-hmm. But like just around and around, like never getting back on the main trail, like just ending up in this bizarre loop of of time and distance. And then like he says he should have been back in his truck at 10, but doesn't make it there until one. Yeah. And, and the detail about <clears> um, <throat> I, I wonder what kind of app that is or what feature I, I've just never played with that on my phone Yeah, to show like. GPS wise where you've been uh, I, I'm guessing he's using just like some sort of hiking app mm, or yeah, oh yeah because there's like all trails or like any number of things in yeah that that'll space. track your progress on a trail and that's that's um was a, a really I think important detail for them to include in this story yeah. to show that during this time when they're walking around and seeing this fire pit and stuck in some strange loop they're actually not moving not moving Mm-hmm. The oscillating hum kind of did me in because he's like they say like, you know, and I get it like you're hiking, you're making it further and further away from city. So you hear cars and like human movement die down. You hear the birds uh, escalate in your brain, right? You hear like the nature sounds. And then as you're leaving, the birds would kind of fade out and then you would start to hear, you know, the highway again. Mm. And at some point in there, like kind of in that in between, he just hears like a weird oscillating. To me, I immediately thought like, oh, UFO. Oh, like, yeah. You're hearing because lost time. Mm-hmm. True. Uh, no, the picture's missing, can't replicate it, like, and just stuck in one spot. Yeah, it does have like UFO vibes. I think so. Just like his memory was erased or replaced. Wow, it's so strange. So strange. It was a bizarre... Oh, I know sometimes you really enjoy those like quick little stories. Mm-hmm. And this I was, do. That's a really good one. Yeah. Just right to the point. No messing around. And like, you know, a skeptical person, a scientific minded person, like works in medical. It's like all the things line up for this yeah. to be particularly unsettling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. This story. I am so excited about this story. I think it is so especially strange and bizarre. Uh, you know, we have talked about sleep paralysis a million times on this show Mm -hmm. a million times but what i don't think we've ever really had a fan talk about is parasomnia and its various disruptions and this fan like this story is just it's well written it's well explained and it's terrifying so it is such an excellent excellent story i'm so excited for it okay dear dan Lindsay, and the rest of the scared to death crew thank you for sharing my experience with the with your listeners, and for creating such a wonderful escape for those of us who can't help but love all things spooky. I've been binge listening for the last few weeks since someone recommended your podcast to me, and though I'm not sure it's been a positive influence on this (laughs) problem of mine. I'm not sure if either of you or anyone who may be listening to the story can relate. I am told roughly 10% of people endure this particular type of parasomnia to some degree. Similar to sleep paralysis, hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations are vivid oral, visual, or kinetic sensations that occur during the transitions between REM sleep and wakefulness without the full body immobilization that comes with sleep paralysis. Like the extension of a dream past the point of waking, superimposed onto real-life surroundings— You are awake, but your mind hasn't stopped conjuring images, Mm. sounds, or sensations just for a few moments. For some people, it may be as simple as being jerked awake by the feeling of falling or swearing you were woken by the sound of a gunshot, 
This is often referred to as exploding head syndrome. Mm -hmm. For others, like myself, it ranges dramatically. Some nights, I'm awoken just an hour or so into my sleep by the sound of slow, deliberate scratching on my headboard above me. But the second I'm fully awake, turning around frantically, the noise has stopped. Some nights, it is waking to the smell of smoke, convinced I'm going to open my eyes to see that I've left my straightener on in the bathroom, and my bathroom's been set ablaze, only for the smell to disappear as soon as I'm fully alert. Visual hallucinations are often distorted and are particularly disturbing. These illusions range dramatically in creepiness. Sometimes it is seeing geometric patterns or writing on the ceiling. Other times it is seeing dark billowing smoke pouring out of the wardrobe door I regretfully left open. And sometimes it's waking up to see a fully grown man with no face sitting on the side of my bed watching me. Many times I recall waking suddenly to see a woman with unnaturally long arms and legs crawling around on the ceiling, her head twisted backwards. Oh my God. Usually these solutions, usually these hallucinations will only last for a few seconds after my eyes have shot open, but holy hell, it can take me two to three seconds. It can make two to three seconds feel like a lifetime. While these sleep-related hallucinations are often terrifying, there is also an immediate recognition that the events are not real. I have always had tendencies leaning towards logical scientific thinking. Never once prior to the events of this story had I considered that there may be more to what I was seeing at night. Now, while I say that, I was also raised by a very spiritual woman who believed in all things supernatural, and it would have been impossible for that not to rub off on me to some degree. I love horror and all things spooky, Mm -hmm. and while I approach everything with a healthy amount of skepticism, I do keep an open mind. I do also feel it is worth mentioning that my mother has always referred to me as, and I cringe as I type this, spiritually sensitive. She has come to this conclusion following my many years of eerily accurate dreams and spot-on intuition. For example, dreaming about my father missing his leg from the knee down just two days before he got into a water skiing accident where a rope got tangled Uh, around his lower leg, severing it completely. Oh my God. He's had a prosthetic ever since. I, however, have always leaned towards writing things like that off as a coincidence. However, I do have trouble saying that same thing about the following events. I had recently moved from Sydney to the UK to begin my master's in psychology and have been lucky enough to have family friends over there who had a house with a self-contained flat on the bottom floor of their two-story home, which was empty and available for me at a ludicrously cheap rent. As a young, single, broke-as-shit woman, Hmm. it was perfect. However, my excitement waned after arriving and seeing the space for the first time. Not that there had been anything wrong with the space physically— It was neat, surprisingly roomy, and decorated in good taste with warm colors and lots of light. My issue was with the feeling of the place. Even after weeks of settling into the flat, I still had moments where I would abruptly feel like I was being watched. I would be sitting at my desk in the corner, suddenly unable to be sat with my back to the room, or laying in bed, reading before going to bed, thinking if I lowered my book, I just might see someone standing there. Then there were the nighttime hallucinations. One night, about 2 a.m., I woke to the sound of a match being struck. I opened my eyes to a dark room. To my left, I heard the sound of someone drawing in a breath. And when my eyes darted over to that side of the room, I saw the faint red embers glowing on the end of a cigarette and knuckles gripping it, illuminated just slightly by the glow. Beyond that, darkness. I flinched, scurrying away from the sight to the other side of the bed, and almost immediately, the image was gone. Cursing my brain for not dreaming up images of puppies or hot shirtless men, Mm -hmm. I went back to sleep, resting easy, knowing it had just been a glitch in the normal operation of a dreaming mind. But the hallucinations continued. A few nights later, I opened my eyes to see a room that looked like nothing like the one I had gone to sleep in. The ceiling and walls were covered. Worn, exposed brick and plaster surrounded me, and all over were symbols smeared haphazardly in some kind of dark paint. There was a foul smell, like gas leaking, but again, it was gone in a moment. 
For the next few weeks, my mind seemed to be stuck on various versions of these hallucinations. The symbols painted on the walls and someone standing in the darkness of the room, lighting a cigarette with a match. Now, I can already hear Lindsay's voice like, she needs to get the fuck out of there. (laughs) But remember, seeing strange, sometimes creepy things that aren't there in the moments after waking up was a totally explainable thing for me. What was new was what happened next. Late one night, after a day of studying, I decided to try and look up some of the symbols I had been seeing. I'm not sure why. I knew they had been something I had already seen somewhere that my subconscious brain had remembered. But after a few minutes of researching, I was immediately put off. They were symbols supposedly related to satanic worship and the occult. I shut my laptop and went to bed. It must have been only a short time later when I woke again. I was in the very light, early stage of falling asleep when I was jerked awake by something. It happened quickly. The feeling of a hand wrapping around my ankle tightly, pulling on my leg in one swift, violent tug. Naturally, I screamed, kicking at the air while scurrying up towards the head of the bed. My heart was pounding like crazy and my breaths were coming out in short, hysterical puffs. My eyes scanned the room and saw nothing out of the ordinary. It was silent, too save for the sound of the rain. As I lay there trying to fall back asleep, I had a hard time trying to convince myself that when I had woken up, feeling like I had been tugged by some invisible force, that I hadn't been a foot or two further down the bed. It all came to a head a few nights later. A guy I, a guy I had been dating was staying the night for the first time, and the last time. Let's call him Dean. It was a fairly late night by the time we went to sleep, and I had woken a few times already, not accustomed to the unfamiliar sounds of another person breathing beside me. So when I drifted into consciousness, again hearing the sound of breathing, I left my eyes closed, assuming it was Dean. However, after a few moments, I realized the sound of the breathing, which was getting closer, was coming from my right side. Dean was on my left. I opened my eyes immediately. What happened next likely took place over the span of just a few seconds, but it was absolute chaos. My first sight was of the ceiling, which again was stripped down and covered in symbols, smeared in that dripping black paint. There was a strange smell again, some kind of mix between cigarettes and hot, sour milk. The now familiar sound of a match being struck had come from somewhere to my right, where the breathing had been, only much closer than normal. I snapped my head around in panic, lifting myself onto my elbow simultaneously, knocking my bedside table in the process. But when I knocked the table, I disturbed my phone, and the screen lit up, illuminating the room for just a moment. This meant I could see more than just the cigarette this time. The cigarette hung out of a mouth that was smiling sinisterly just a foot away from the bed at eye level with me. He had dark, greasy hair that fell in matted waves over the side of his face and wrinkly, leathery skin. The whites of his eyes were clear, but his irises were either black or his pupils were so dilated that they swallowed any color that might have otherwise been there. My phone went back into sleep mode, plunging the room into darkness once again. A low, growling sound came from the space right beside my ear. Somewhere in the middle of this, I screamed, kicking my legs out towards the man as if it was going to do anything, and scrambling over to the other side of the bed, forgetting that Dean lie there. By the time, by this time, my scream had woken him up, and he was thrashing around like he didn't know which way to go. Just before we both fell backwards over the opposite side of the bed onto the floor, my defensive kicking had knocked my phone once again, illuminating the room with the screen light. I heard Dean yell before we both hit the floor, and at first, I thought he was screaming because I had frightened him. But after we managed to untangle ourselves from the blanket, Dean raced over the door and flicked on the light switch. His face was white, drained of all color, and his hand shook where it rested on the switch, as if he was worried the lights might go out again if he, let, if he left it unguarded. Did you? He stopped, swallowing hard his eyes darting back and forth between where I lay on the floor and the other side of the room, then up towards the ceiling. You saw that, right? He said. I froze. Dean had seen it too. This could no longer be written off as my usual parasomnia. Dean kind of disappeared after that night. Not that I could blame him. And the very next day, I sat down with my family friends, the owners of the house, to tell them I was moving out. When they asked me why, I hesitated. 
Louise sat across from me, waiting for a reply when her husband George stepped up to the table. Something happened to you, didn't it? Something about the almost helpful, somewhat nervous expression he said on his face had loosened my lips, and I told them everything, albeit a watered-down version. When I was finished, Louise smiled slightly. Show her, she said to George. George proceeded to race into the office down the hall and came back seconds later with a folder. When he put it on the table in front of me, wordlessly I opened it and I swear to God my heart actually stopped. There were photos. Photos of a room with a ceiling and walls of worn, exposed brick and plaster. Symbols smeared in dark paint all over the place, occupying just about every free space. It was exactly what I had been seeing in my supposed hallucinations. George and Louise proceeded to tell me they had bought the house nearly two decades prior for an absolute steal. It was being sold as is for much less than the median house price in the area for a home of that size, as it had been repossessed by the bank, untouched, and in whatever condition the previous owner had left it in. Apparently, the occult symbols painted all over the lower floor of the house hadn't been enough to put them off. They had simply renovated the room, plastering over the symbols. Since then, George and Louise have also moved out, and after nearly two decades, I think I know what might have caused their change of heart. I hope this creeps you out sufficiently. Keep them coming, Mackenzie. Good story, Mackenzie. Is that the craziest thing? Mm-hmm. That folder at the end, yeah, seals it. Oh, my God. And just, like, I can uh, find myself, like, relating to her so much where it's like, if for all these years, you've had this sleep condition. So you were justifying it the whole mm-hmm. time. Like, oh, okay, there's my brain again. There it is. There it is. Just, like, assuming, just assuming mm-hmm. that it's not, like, and now are you second-guessing everything you've ever seen in this, like, parasomnia state your entire oh, life? I bet. Oh, my God. How do you ever sleep again? <sighs> That's wild. Yeah, I, I, I can see why you're excited for that story. That is so creepy. So creepy. Yeah, so many, yeah, so so scary. And, and like you said, very well put together. Mm-hmm. Very well written. Oof. Yes, Mackenzie, you have wow. fantastic writing skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was giving me the chills. I know. And just like, oh my God, so smart of that family to have taken photos before they renovated. Because how often do you like, you know, paint a room in your house just normally without- But I guess that room, you'd be like, what the hell i know but then like i don't know there also could be a part of you that's like ah we don't need to take pictures or Mm -hmm. like we don't need to remember that yeah so that's awesome that they had it (sighs) i just i have nightmares pretty regularly and i just can't imagine like saying to you like oh my god i had this crazy nightmare and then you just like throwing down a folder of images match your nightmare Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. poor mackenzie yeah poor mackenzie i'm glad you moved out girl glad Mm -hmm. you moved out Mm -hmm. i'm glad that george and louise also they're out. Everybody GTFO'd. No, no Donnas. No Donnas. No <laughs> Donnas, no Darrens. <laughs> I love it. Oh, do you want to do uh, some Annabelle shout outs? Yeah. All right. Let's have it. So thanks to the following Annabelles for supporting what we do here. Uh, Chase Phelps, Katrina Davis, Alyssa Bode, Jake Berry, Cassie Leffers, Covey, Logan Frank, Cheyenne Crisis, the villainous of all the books. Funny. Uh, Justin Bates. Juanita Villan- Juanita Villanueva, Big Nasty, Space Wolf 57, Dahlia Marino, <laughs> Nikki Broadhead, Sean Rodarte or Rodarte, uh, Clayton Gibson, Elizabeth Ogles, Michelle Out Them 12 Threes. I know, I don't know. It's maybe inside joke. Uh, Megan Bolt, Brianna Rosen, Natalie Lopez, Lovely Layla and Ryan. Uh, Danielle Sterling, Steve Schaefer, Madison Allison, and Mad Badger. I don't know. The Michelle, it's like Michelle, 12, yeah, the th- uh, out them 12 threes. I'm like, I don't I don't get it. Yeah, I, I kept trying to think. That sounds very hoodish to me. <laughs> she's out the 12 three. What is, I don't know what that is, but it sounds like she's out the 12 three. <laughs> thank, thank you, Tyler, for making us sound cool. <laughs> I'd like to thank the mm. following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon and making our annual Giving Tree a possibility this year. Matt Kelly, Kelly Crawford, Megan Lavoy, Jonathan Arambula, Cynthia Francine, Felix Carino, Katrina Corona, Melanie Cortinas, Sleepy Tony, Joseph Grimrose, Monique Rodriguez, 
Christian Morrison, Christina Barrett, Endless Eventide, Brian Spann, Zadwana, Gabrielle Robinson, Stephanie Wilson, Rachel Aboud, Hayden Hops, M. Cooper, M. Cooper, I'm sure that you're sick of being told like, oh, Emily Cooper, like Emily in Paris. That's for all my girls who like to watch trashy girl TV without their husbands. Shane Parks and Risley Stone, which is an awesome name. Mm -hmm. And then I have the following spoopy shout outs to Austin from Anna. Happy anniversary, baby cakes. I love you the most. This is an awesome one. To three raccoons in a hoop skirt with matches <laughs> from your friend. Happy birthday and congratulations on your three-year anniversary. You get it. To Dominic from your mom, Katie, happy birthday. To Megan, a.k.a. Baby Doll, from your clown husband, Dylan, happy one-year anniversary. You're the best thing in my life. I love you. And to Jessica from Juan, shout out to my homegirl. Fun. And that's it. Oh, uh, well, that's our show, everyone. Uh, again, hopefully we'll hopefully we'll sound 100% soon. Yeah, thanks for bearing with yeah, us. Yeah, so annoying. Um, but at least the, the stories continue to be great that the fans send in to take us through this little stretch. Yes, you guys, carry us forward. <laughs> uh, thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to uh, Logan Keith, our poor Logan, trapped oh in an airport. Uh, he is trapped in Minneapolis right now. Yep, after just getting strep throat and just, uh, he's been getting pummeled too. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks to Tyler C. Uh, for work on social media and, uh, and Logan as well for that. And then Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. And thanks to Tyler for producing and directing today. Tyler holding down the fort. He's the only no one kidding. who's better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was really sick until just a couple days ago. It's a cesspool here. It's crazy. Uh, thanks to uh, Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number four. Uh, I found today's first story that took place in that prison, and uh, producers Sarah Finch and Olivia Lee found the second. The, the well, you know, found the source material for the Annabelle story. Mm -hmm. uh, subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content and to see pictures that accompany episodes at Scared to Death Podcast. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, where you can meet other horror lovers. And you can follow us on TikTok, at Scared to Death Podcast, to check out special moments and highlights from the episodes. And if you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes and help with our donations, to help with our donations, you can uh, check out our Patreon. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you are scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, Fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. It's to detract from the fact that I have not washed my hair in three days, and this was the first time I washed my face in three days. I've had no makeup. I'm lucky I remember to brush my teeth. Okay. Okay.